Welcome to this morning's panel discussion on the boundaries of material science. Uh, technology can only really develop at the same pace that material science develops. Uh, there's lots of different challenges. Uh, there's thermal challenges, there's uh, all sorts of different barriers. And this panel is here today to discuss uh, where the opportunities and threats in material science lie. To my extreme right, we have uh, Tom Forsyth from Kaizen Corporation. Uh, welcome, Tom. Uh, Glad to be here. To his left, we have Watson Tseng from Shen Mao Corporation. To his left, we have uh, Tetsuru Nishimura from uh, Nihon Superior. Right. Thank you. And to my right here, we have Brian Tolino from Microsoft Corporation. Uh, so welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to start maybe at the end with you, Tom. Uh, my first question being, what are the uh, currently the biggest gaps in material science? Well, as the, the cleaning side of things, we tend to be a, a both pushing forward on the materials as well as being very reactive because as the, the we deal with really two big input sides. One is the soldering materials and the, the uh, evolution that's happening there, uh, as well as the materials of construction in the various devices, whether it's a phone or a, a mm -hmm. toy or a spaceship, whatever it may be, right? So we have to com be complete and it comes back to the compatibility points, right? How do we line up with those and, and, and stay, af stay afront of those? So it's more about being very aware of what those developments are and then using our own requirements to, to push forward and new materials, particularly on, uh, on inhibition and, uh, and, and keeping things uh, very green and safe. Those tend to be the big challenges. So what you're saying is, you, is you're really reactive to what we, we, uh, we tend to the, be. The, we, the, the paste and uh, the, the pastes react to the mean. designs, mm -hmm. and then we react to what they react to. Watson, can I ask you the same question? Watson, can I ask you the same question? Where do you see the the, the, the gaps mm -hmm. in material science at the moment? Yeah, nowadays uh, the electronic products are getting thinner and smaller in form factor, but on the other hand, uh, the more uh, bit uh, band width and uh, low energy consumption is required for the electronic products. Mm -hmm. So the sort of materials uh, needs to fit in all these different applications. And also uh, the automotive industry is rising. They are using more and more electronic devices. So that uh, uh, high reliability uh, sort of materials are required to be used in these uh, applications. Okay, so as new technologies come along, such as 5G and stuff like that, that's bringing in new challenges that are, that are pushing the material science. Okay. Yes. Uh, Tetsuro, um, same question to you. What do you think? Yes, uh, I have, uh, uh, currently we have uh, very big problems about uh, high frequency products mm -hmm. uh, because uh, solar connection, it's uh, getting small. However, uh, Soda fillet does have uh, some uh, uh, like a condenser, so that's why it's not good for the high, very high frequency products. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a good big challenge uh, for uh, the industry, uh, especially for as you said, the 5G or higher uh, frequency models. So we have to find out new uh, good connection uh, method or material uh, mm -hmm. for making the. Uh, new products, right? Okay, Brian, you you're in a unique position that that you you had your earlier career in the materials science uh, front end uh, with Henkel and other companies, uh, but you're now at the consumer end um, and and seeing how these affect things in the, in the real world. Uh, so, uh, wh what would you like to see? Where do you see the gaps? Um, so, I, I think there's a couple of things. So, just from I think there's a lot of it was already said as miniaturization, uh, 5G, you know, all those things are driving. But when I look at it, on a, what you want to do is you want multifunctional materials. Mm -hmm. So a solder joint that's not just the connection and the mechanical, electrical connection, but it has an effect on the RF. So how do you design around that? Or whether it's in the design of the product or the design of the material. Mm -hmm. um, you look at, I see a lot of stuff coming into printed electronics, e-textiles, not necessarily for us, but just the industry in general. And there, you need a product that can maybe can be worn as well as be conductive or as a sensor embedded into a jacket or into a and something else. So those materials have to not just do the traditional carry a current and you know on a circuit board, but now it has to be maybe it has to have a certain hand feel or it has to 
resist sweat or resist, you know, Coke spilling on your shirt and things like that. So, right. and even inside a product, you'll get that, right? So, yeah. is it a shielding material? And it also has to be, uh, maybe it's an EMI shield and thermally conductive, and it also helps with, you know, as an antenna. And so, jamming those all together, I think I see a lot of that multifunctional material yeah. is sort of the next big leap. In, uh, it's interesting, yeah. Technology. yeah, because a couple of weeks ago at the Wearables Expo in, in, in Japan, I saw some, some thermal jackets coming out for, for people that are working in, in uh, uh, winter sports and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But rather than having threads that are conductive or, or um, uh, cables throughout the jacket, they were using actually um, DuPont's uh, conductive paste. Oh, PTC ink. Yeah, yeah. literally, yeah. Uh, which uh, I thought was an interesting approach, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they could afford to do it. Uh, as you know, with conductive adhesives, you're using a silver conductor, uh, yeah. which can be expensive, but they managed to find a, a cheaper way of doing it. So uh, that was interesting. Um, Tom, if I can go back to you, what, what is producing the biggest challenges um, in terms of thermal and, and harsh environment? I mean, what, what, it, uh, what are the biggest challenges for you from well, a cleaning think, perspective? Well, I think uh, Brian mentioned it. The, 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 uh, the key part is this idea of multiple functionality as well as uh, ever-decreasing form factor. You know, because now as we're trying to remove them from... Of course, cleaning has been a gap in, in, in the technology over the last 10 or 20 years for many things. But now as these form factors and these multiple uses are coming into play, particularly as the frequencies go up, those are we getting the right residues in, in the right places or are they now throwing off the signal? Are they causing that feel issue that's now was okay before and it's not really a conducting problem, but it's causing some other deficiency. So cleaning is now coming back in a number of different ways, but the challenge becomes the areas that we have to penetrate are much more difficult than they were even, even a couple of years ago, never mind 20 years ago. And, and that's that driver. That form factor tends to be the, the number one issue, coupled with new and exotic materials to, uh, to make sure that there's a good, solid compatibility. Those are the big drivers. And harsh environments the, is, is, of course, just uh, amps that up even more. You know, right. it's one thing to have it on someone's coat. It's another to have it under the hood. Uh, you know, those are all different drivers. And, and of course, the, the what, one of the points we'll get to later, mm -hmm. as you look at the service factors that are uh, uh, being projected for autonomous vehicles, um, those lifetimes are significantly increased from a uh, an operating hours perspective. Right. Uh, and that, that, of course, speaks to a much higher level of uh, reliability in life which is where, again, cleaning may come in. As we consider these long-term uh, residue concerns, does that you know, bring some value to the equation? Those are going to be interesting questions over the next couple of years. Right, right, yeah. Now, there's a, there's a lot more uh, challenges coming in from, from uh, harsh environments, uh, uh, of course. A lot of that coming from automotive, of course. But uh, what do you see the challenge, uh, are the biggest challenges for you ahead uh, for Shen Mao? For solder materials, uh, first of all, we have to develop the more reliable solder alloys for the harsh environment to survive uh, uh, more cycles of thermal, cy uh, thermal cycling and thermal shock. Mm -hmm. This is from the alloy point of view. And on the other hand, uh, the flux system has to be uh, redeveloped. Uh, if it has to be cleaned, we want to make the flux easier to clean. And uh, if it's no clean application, uh, we must to des design our flux so that uh, even after thermal cycling, the reliability of the flux uh, remains uh, uh, at high level, meaning the flux will not crack uh, during the temp thermal cycling, and also uh, there won't be any uh, uh, electron migration caused because of the uh, unactivated uh, activator inside. The flux. the flux, yeah. Okay. Well, flux, flux development, of course, is a lot easier than alloy development. Alloy development is quite a, a more, uh, uh, a longer, more involved process for sure. Uh, uh, Tetsuro san, uh, do you have any views on that? Well, uh, uh, as a sort of manufacturer, uh, the same as uh, Watson said, uh, however, uh, uh, my company uh, working on uh, more uh, dynamic. Uh, can I say the uh, some uh, sintering paste? Mm -hmm. So and the conductivity and uh, also heat transfer uh, better than the solder. So that's why we are developing the uh, some sintering 
uh, sintering so, uh, uh, silver paste and also uh, soda paste. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. but to come up, uh, survive uh, longer mm -hmm. uh, service uh, under the high uh, severe conditions. Yeah, I've noticed a rise in sintering uh, as, a, as a technology. A lot more people using it. This is to get this is to get better conduct better. Conductivity. What, what conductivity is the reason? Conductivity and also uh, st stiffness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Brian. So, um, <clears throat> well, we see more. I mean, uh, the stuff I work in now is not so much high reliability; is much more on the thermal end. Right. So, uh, you think about any consumer electronics, whether it be a phone that you're holding in your hand, a laptop, uh, a device you wear on your head, a head-mounted display. It's all skin contact, and so you want to shed the heat. So in a car, you can have you can shed that heat out to the environment. It could be hot because you're not touching the engine. Right. But if you're touching a phone, you're touching the display in your head. You have to get the heat out, but not burn or make the person uncomfortable. Right. And so that's a, quite a challenge. And so how do you develop thermal um, architecture such that you can remove that heat, whether it's uh, utilizing a sintering material or utilizing a conductive right. or a unique heat sink design? They're able to get that heat away from all these devices that are running as fast as they can, generating as much content as they can, and yet not make the user uncomfortable. Yeah, for the last few years, we've been fighting that battle uh, with LEDs. Uh, you know, LEDs produce a lot of heat. It fries the solid state to electronics behind them. And uh, if you look behind a lot of these LED uh, assemblies, there's nothing but big um, heat sinks, you know, trying to pull away the, the heat uh, from, from, uh, from the assembly. Um, Looking at the automotive industry, it has bringing a whole set of um, new challenges in itself. Uh, the amount of electronics, as we all know, within cars is increasing exponentially. Uh, it's going to be 50% of the cost of a car in the next five years. Uh, but the car's not getting any bigger. Uh, so we've got to get all these electronics into that same space. Um, what challenges is that, is that bringing you? Well, that that's the key point. Just as now, a heat isn't really the, as I think as much of a driver there because you're right. We've got the environment outside, uh, but once again, these things are often in that uh, you know some of them are tucked away in a in a cabin where they're not going to get much environmental exposure, but other of the electronics are out there getting uh, getting beat up. So you know that's the big driver, and I think the long term reliability questions of what is that service factor. Some of the numbers I've seen is that the uh, the service hours are going to be maybe moved from seven or eight thousand hours over the lifetime of a car to maybe north of twenty thousand. You know, that's a that's a big jump, right. uh, and, and I think that has a long list of impacts for materials and as well as cleaning and design. Uh, because now, if we're going to have that kind of long life, it, I think it's a little bit of a different equation for all of us. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's yeah. I think that's the number one driver that just is going to ripple through everything if, yeah. if those figures turn out to be true. Well, you know, autonomous vehicles in particular, you know, the number of sensors and things that are going to be involved in these is incredible. Um, do you see any specific challenges coming from that area? Uh, the pressure of miniaturization on automotive devices are not so critical in our point of view because uh, we have seen uh, others uh, like uh, portable devices who uh, need even smaller form factor and smaller sort of joint. But on automotive, we, we, we do not see a very uh, critical requirement from that. But on the other hand, uh, uh, there are many different devices like sensors uh, or controllers has to be installed on the uh, car and uh, uh, they have to use a different uh, way of assembly. In the past, we have SMT and we uh, uh, fix uh, the circuit board on the, on the body of the car, but now uh, many small electronic parts has to be soldered directly on the uh, car so that uh, they have to use different way of soldering and dispensing, like uh, laser soldering uh, mm -hmm. is applied uh, on, on these applications. So yeah. we have to develop a different uh, type of solder material for these applications. Yeah, that's interesting. We've seen a rise in laser soldering applications here this week uh, at, at the show. So it seems to be a growing trend. Uh, Tetsuro-san, you, you do a lot of work in the automotive industry. I mean, preparing for the for the rise in in automotive electronics. What are you? What is Nihon Superior doing for that? Yeah, we do a lot of job. And uh, why uh, motor industry is so tough? Uh, because the uh, uh, people 
just switch on and suddenly pick up, heat it up and uh, also get a lot of vibrations. Mm -hmm. So that's why the people are worried about uh, uh, reliability issues, so such as uh, some cycle vibrations. So that's why uh, how we can develop the uh, better quality or uh, more reliable uh, connections. Right. We have to have a nice um, joint connection design and also, as he said, uh, some, uh, some uh, how can I say, uh, running through, uh, cool down. Okay, I can say cool down. You know, uh, daytime and uh, very hot weather, it's uh, everything go up. Uh, some components heat it up uh, more than five, five, 150 degrees Celsius and have to keep the uh, temperature low. So that's why the summer conductivity is very important for the uh, connections. And also, uh, like uh, Tom said, uh, uh, humidity issues also right. quite severe. Mm -hmm. So everything. Uh, a lot of challenges there. Yeah, very, very, very big, yeah. big challenge. Really. Interesting one you mentioned there about, about vibration. I mean, with the relaxation of the regulations last year in, in Europe, uh, a lot of uh, solder companies have started in, in uh, including a lot more bismuth into their their alloys and, and uh, you know which is quite brittle um, so you have to get the the, the right um, balance correct uh, okay. to, to, <laughs> to cope with the vibration uh, in, in the car uh, Brian I mean you work for obviously Microsoft which is a consumer led uh, uh, organization but you must be developing a lot of products to get inside the car space um, are you looking at this? I think not necess not directly. So a lot of what I think there's a lot of sensor work that we're we're leveraging. So for example, you know, autonomous vehicles, I think there's a lot of, of sensor and AI. So certainly Microsoft doing a lot in the AI arena on mm -hmm. the on the computing and programming side, but um, you know, if you look at the Connect product that was on Xbox, right? It's a it's a way to image a person or a room and understanding how the image processing is, mm -hmm. the sensing, and so whether we're developing those technologies internally or utilizing what's out there uh, being developed for that market and utilize them inside a consumer product, mm -hmm. which then requires a further miniaturization. It has a different power requirement because in a car you have a large battery you can draw off of, but you know, in a consumer device you don't have that power. Right. And so in addition to the thermal challenges, there's also the power management and making sure that how do you how do you do all these fun things you want to do and not drain the battery in five minutes right because we all know how frustrating that can be yeah, and nobody wants so. that yeah battery technology seems to be running you know um, very 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 um, low um, so you know basically smart factory initiatives are employing a range of sensors to digitize and report data coming off of equipment uh, at the moment once we've finished characterizing uh, how machines behave and, and interconnect the next leap surely has to be to characterize materials behavior. Uh, what is the panel's view on, on, on this area? Well, I, I think you're right. The, the, it, we as an industry are, are leading the charge in manufacturing, I think, to continue to improve our operations and our processes, not, not only in our, as we're manufacturing cleaners or paste, but, but downstream with our customers. And, and that's all about efficiency, it's all about uh, inefficiency is not just getting the line speed to run faster, it's getting the line to run with less intervention. Um, and, and the key to less intervention is more monitoring, more predictive analytics to, to really study things. And, and of course, as you back away from that, see now you've identified a failure or some kind of uh, bottleneck. Well, what drives that? Is that a materials issue? Is that a, a logistical moving things around sort of issue? And, and I think there's a, a, a very broad future for folks that are working on uh, solving some of those puzzles. I don't think it's a, uh, a one, uh, uh, you know, supercomputer solution. I think this is uh, sector experts that figure out how their piece of the puzzle works, whether it be on the paste side. Obviously, there's lots of things that go on in there. Um, and, and certainly, as, uh, as we're further downstream on the cleaner end of things, trying to react to all of it. So I think that, that data analytics is going to be a big deal in, in lots of sectors uh, mm -hmm. along the production line to, uh, to make the world a better place. Watson, do you believe we have to we have to have a, a better understanding of the character, the behavior of of um, materials going going forward? I mean, I'm sure you have a 
a lot of knowledge about how Shen Mao uh, solders work with your other materials, but you know, do we have a, we need to have a better understanding of how Shen Mao works with a, a, a Henkel underfill or, 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 or other material sets uh, uh, that your customers might be using. Yeah, uh, for solder materials, uh, our customers are looking for uh, even higher melting temperature and lower melting temperature application selections. And also uh, outside uh, solder materials, we have been uh, thinking for many years, can we uh, have uh, alternative materials to be used uh, in uh, the uh, assembly and packaging applications? Uh, for example, uh, uh, we are also developing the silver sintering materials and uh, many other application uh, materials are, are in, uh, in con consideration. Mm -hmm. So that uh, um, from our point of view, in the future, there will be uh, many different uh, uh, materials to be selected by different applications. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the industry uh, needs to uh, narrow down the selections because uh, they, they don't want to control, manage so many different um, uh, materials on their production line. So uh, the ultimate uh, uh, goal is can we find a material that can be used for all kinds of application and get a good reliability with a low cost. Yeah. I, think, um, I think we have to characterize materials and, and uh, eventually be able to digitize that information. Um, uh, Tetsuro, uh, do you have a view on this? You know, uh, the solar connection, mm. it's uh, because of miniaturize the uh, components. So that's why they are almost impossible to see the uh, connections uh, by, of course, naked eyes, impossible. <laughs> but uh, how we can uh, observe the solar connections, uh, which is good or not, it's a very good, big challenge, uh, I believe. So that's why we have to find, or we have to make an another a new, uh, let's say, vehicle uh, to min minimize and uh, go through the connections and that uh, this is a good, this is no good. How to repair, how to <laughs> rework. Anyway, we have to work hard to find out a new technology for okay. the reliable joints. Okay. Brian, when, when you were at Henkel Corporation, you, you had a lot of, you did a lot of work in creating material sets. So again, it was how a Henkel solder worked with a Henkel underfill or a Henkel encapsulant. How does that, how do we as an industry start to broaden that church and look at how these products work with other products and yeah. really understand them and eventually digitize them? Yeah, this, this discussion comes up quite a bit. So um, we actually talk about this a lot in like committee development, right? So right. in the IPC standards committees, we often discuss, okay, can we on the underfill committee or solder paste or or conformal coding, and this discussion comes up of, well, how can we test all these different things? And what happens is, is every year, every company comes out with new products, new materials, so it's a never, if you try to do it all, it's never ending. And so I really think it's incumbent upon the users, so for example, us, mm -hmm. we would do that work up front. So if we're, gonna, if we're gonna use a particular set of products together, we need to test and verify that that's gonna work in our end device mm -hmm. together. Right. And then how we, how we capture that data and how do we share that across a large organization. I think that's a key element, right? So I could do it in my lab if for my product that I'm working on. Maybe someone else is doing it that's on surface, someone else is doing you know, and how do we, and, and any, every organization has that, a large organization. Right. So how do you share that information across an org or at the CMs, if they're doing it for customer A and customer B, how do they, can and how do they share that information without impinging upon the privacy or the, mm -hmm. the aspects there. So right. I think that's, it's, it's something we should strive for, but it's a very challenging objective. It's very challenging, there's a lot to it because you've got to do independent uh, ver verification of each, uh, mm -hmm. each um, material. You, you know, you, yeah. can't, you can't just go off what's on the, the spec sheet. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be an ongoing debate, but, uh, but uh, certainly it's, um, it's going to be an interesting one. Gentlemen, we've run right out of time. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, Tom Forsyth from uh, Kaizen, Watson Sen from Shen Mao, uh, Tetsuro Nishimuro from uh, Nihon Superior, and of course, uh, Brian Tolino from Microsoft. Uh, and thank you for joining us today.